Well, good morning. I'd like to add my welcome to what's already been given, especially if this is your first time engaging with church. I want you to know that the God of the Bible is invitational. He's inviting us in to relationship and he's doing that with us today. We've been working through the book of John, these seven I am statements that Jesus made in that fourth gospel. And Jesus in these statements identifies himself as the long promised Messiah come to rescue his people. If you're new to this thing we call church, you might find such a claim outrageous. God with skin on, is that really what Jesus is claiming? Well, yeah, absolutely is. But you don't have to take my word for it. Go on your own investigation of who you decide Jesus to be. We began this journey on Good Friday and we thought about C.S. Lewis' claim where he said, Jesus wants to be known as liar, lunatic or Lord. He doesn't want us to be lukewarm. He's calling a decision from us. Now, you don't have to agree with my proposition that I call him Lord. You've got your own call. You just can't call him nothing. He, he longs, he longs for us to make a call on his identity. You know, Jesus isn't a good person if he deliberately misled his friends with these claims. He's a liar. Jesus isn't a good prophet if he was actually a mile off the mark with these claims. He's a lunatic. So what do you decide to call him? Liar, lunatic or Lord? These I am statements through the Gospel of John can certainly help us. They go a long way towards us coming face to face with this Christ and deciding who he is. It's worth investigating Jesus. And this fourth gospel, John, is a great place to start. I've got this um, friend named Wayne. And he said, whenever a seeker comes to him and says, you know, I'm interested in God, where would I start? Wayne always directs them to this book of John. This fourth gospel, he says, it's, it's a great place to start. And he said, when this person comes back to him and said, OK, I've done that, what now? He, Wayne's response is always the same. Go and read it again. Why would he do that? Because he's so convinced, as are I, that engaging with this gospel of John, and particularly these I am statements, forces us into this place of deciding. And it's a good thing to decide about Jesus. Today we reach number seven of seven. Chronologically, this is the last of the I am claims. In John 15, I am the true vine, Jesus says here. Similar to his earlier statement, actually, in John 6, where he says, I am the bread. The first and the final analogy have the same idea in mind. Jesus is the sustenance of life. He is the place from which we draw our very existence from. But there's a significant difference here in this one. Unlike the I am the bread statement, which was kind of an invitation in that analogy to just be a consumer, just take in the living Christ. Here it's different. Jesus says, yes, I'm the vine, but you are the branches. And so the idea here is we're not only consumers, we're actually producers of the fruit that Christ wants from our lives. And my connectivity to him is the thing that determines whether I live a productive life or a wasted life. In this regard, it's possible to fake it for a period of time, be an illusion, be an empty shell. Because if John 15 is accurate, true life can only, only be found in him. And so if a person is disconnected from the living Christ, although they might have an appearance of life, actually, if we came back a week later, a month later, a year later, we'd find that there isn't life there at all. Let me illustrate. Some people's lives look like this. I mean, there's no hiding it. They're dead. They're, they're, their existence is lifeless. Other people's lives bear more resemblance to this. They're, there's colour. It looks green and growing. And yet, both of these are actually dead. The moment these little branches here got disconnected from the tree, their life source, they died. And so, what, so whilst some people's lives have this appearance and some people's lives have this appearance, actually, if they're disconnected from the life source, they're both dead. Now, as we enter our reading today in 
John 15, 1. I want you to notice, notice a small but significant word. Jesus says here, I am the true vine. He doesn't just say I'm the vine. He could have just said that. It would have been a complete sentence without this little adjective, but it's there. I am the true vine. In John 15, 1 at the beginning of our reading, why is this little adjective necessary? Why the true vine? I think it's an admission from Jesus. He's not the only one standing in this space claiming to have life, claiming to have a purpose, claiming to be life-giving. There's other sources that are begging for our attention too, begging for our investment, many of them. Perhaps this rings a bell for you. You're like, oh, yeah, yeah, I embrace that. I thought sex was the thing that was going to bring my life meaning and purpose and enjoyment, and I tried it. I went berserk in that space. I had many sexual encounters, but I wound up feeling like that. Someone else will say, well, yeah, I, I thought my career was going to provide me with life and meaning and purpose. And I went hard. I ran hard in the rat race and I won. But at the end of the day, I looked back and realised even though I was a winner, I was in the wrong race. I was still a rat. Uh, it financially paid off. Yes, I, 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 I'm well set. And yet, strangely, I still feel an emptiness. Someone else will say, well, yeah, I thought popularity was going to do it for me. I mean, I went through primary school and I was that kid that was bullied and picked on. Nobody liked me. Nobody wanted to be my friend. And, and throughout high school, I reinvented myself. I put out a new model and everybody fell in love with me then. But actually, I wonder if they really love me as a person or that they love the image that I portray. When I'm all alone left to think about it, actually life feels a fair bit like that. It's only in Christ that we really have life. He is the true vine. And so we enter our reading with that in mind this morning. John 15, reading from verse 1. I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch of mine that doesn't produce fruit and he prunes the branches that do bear fruit so they'll produce even more fruit. You have already been pruned and purified by the message I have given you. Remain in me and I remain in you. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine and you, know, you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. Yes, I am the vine. You are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. We need to read this next verse with kind of one eye closed in order to cope with it. It's heavy. Anyone who does not remain in me is thrown away like a useless branch and withers. Such branches are gathered into a pile and burned. But if you remain in me and my words remain in you, You'll ask anything you want and it will be granted. When you produce much fruit, you are my true disciples. And this brings great glory to my Father. And may the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his holy word today. If Jesus is the true vine, and I've already declared my hand, I, I think he is, but we'll leave it as an if for the sake of our conversation this morning. If Jesus is the true vine, there's some repercussions. First one, I am designed absolutely to live attached to him. There is an emphasis here in this scripture on staying near Christ, abiding in him. The wind is to remain attached. I just must if my life is to flourish. Apparently, everything about me living a blessed life hangs on that. Me staying attached to the vine. This has repercussions then on how I think about my religious experience. Going to church for an hour and flicking on a religious switch is not it. It's not as though I do my duty and I come along, I sing a couple of songs, I put money in the plate and I go out and get on with life and that's it, that's the win. No, 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 that's not it. Jesus longs for a daily connection. 
And it would be completely out of order to elevate one hour a week above the other 167. He wants to do life with me then. In connection, tight, intimate, living close to him. That is the image that this true vine brings up. A linked in branch. No on and off switch, connected without anything interrupting that. How do we live out that connection? Well, verse 7 is clear. His word is central to the process. His words must live in me. Here's what this means. And I know people under 30 listening today will go, so old school. We cannot claim to be growing in faith with Bibles that are empty and dusty. It's that simple. That's not supposed to sound like a guilt trip, but it's supposed to sound real. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. The person who engages heaven with an open Bible and an open heart is well positioned to live out this fruitful life that Jesus has in mind. I listened to an interview this week of one of my mentors. His name's Alan. He's been in church leadership, pastoral work for 30 plus years. And the interviewer asked about what were some of the struggles that he's encountered during that time. And then after hearing about the struggles, he went on to ask um, Alan, what's some of the wins? What personally can you look at and go, well, yeah, that, that, I grew there. I can celebrate that. Alan's answer shocked me, shocked me, absolutely shocked. He said, I used to come home and constantly complain and be angry and frustrated to my wife each night about how the church was going and how people weren't getting it, etc. Why did that shock me? Because in the 10 years I've known Alan, I've never seen a skerrick of that. None of the sort. He's the most kind, gentle, loving person you could ever hope to meet. So what's happened? Well, Alan underwent an examination of the scripture where the fruit of the spirit talks about the gentleness that ought to be present in the life of a Christ follower. And he had to acknowledge that that wasn't him at that point in his life. And he's grown as a result of engaging with God's word. And God's word is always wildly transformative in the way it impacts on our heart. Well, is the Bible the only way I can grow then? No. No. But there's no substitute for it either. This is interesting for me because I love worship music. You come into my home and my kids will tell you it's playing 24-7. Every spare minute I've got pretty much, it's there, it's on. Worship music. And I love it. And I think God loves it. I love to worship him. And yet, even there, it's not a substitute for the purity of God's Word. Jesus says here in John 15, 7, his words need to be my meditation. His words need to come deep and abide in me. And they can't if I haven't first deposited them. I must flood my life with the word of God. There's no other alternative. Jesus didn't say, here, you'll bear a lot of fruit. Your life will go well as long as you can sing. He didn't say that. He said, my word must go deep. You must stay attached to me via that. If Jesus is a true vine, I must live attached to him. Otherwise, I cannot be productive. I think church people are majorly, majorly, majorly underestimating God's resolve for fruitfulness. It's hardly mild. John 15 gives every indication it's red hot. Sizzling. God demands his people to bear fruit, to to live productive lives, period. I grew up in an environment that pushed this hard to the point of being legalistic. Legalism is an attempt to live in a godly way without the help of God's spirit. It's obedience for the sake of obedience. It detaches love from the equation. I follow the righteous way because if I step off the path, well, God might strike me dead and certainly those in the church will judge me. 
It's this religious worldview that's about rules and misses relationship. It's legalism. It's a failure to appreciate that everything I do for Christ comes from this place that I am already accepted. I'm coming from a place of approval. I'm not working for that approval. And that was my early church experience, legalism. It's kind of go hard or go home. It was a very, very driven experience. It was high on guilt and duty and compliance and low on connection and approval and intimacy with God. Maybe you can relate if you're involved in church in the 80s. What's happened next? Well, whenever we react, we overreact. Well, that's our tendency anyway as human beings. Whenever we react, we overreact. So what now? Well, we've moved from legalism, dare I say, and I make this observation carefully, over to laziness, where it's kind of like no one's asking questions about anything. It's a subtle but severe, severe trend. The mantra now in the average church is, you're not a robot, you're not a machine, you don't have to perform for anybody, you're a human being, not a human doing. Yeah? Yeah? There's this big swing towards not putting any expectation on anyone because we're human beings, not human doings. Well, careful. We could be setting up friends as enemies with that statement. If we go back from the Gospel of John, one book prior to the book of Luke, we have in this account of two sisters there in Luke who, who host Jesus for a meal. So there is Jesus in the, in the lounge room of this family home and one sister misses opportunity to engage with him because she is so busy doing in the kitchen, preparing the meal and doing dishes, making preparations, etc. So she missed the point of being with Jesus. Now that's an important distinction that we can't afford to miss, being with Jesus. Otherwise we live very, very busy lives, do, 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 but it's just legalism. It's kind of compliance without relationship. John 15 doesn't tell us, you'll be fruitful because my rules are in you. It doesn't say that. It says you'll be fruitful when you get my words in you. It's always relational. It's always a conversation with Jesus. It's a friendship. That was missing in the church of the 80s in my experience. But I wonder if our challenge now is that we've overshot way, 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 way to the other side. We've forgotten about doing anything because we're so emphasised only on being with Jesus. Sure, the story of the two sisters is a warning against missing the being part. And yet don't miss that Dr Luke puts his story right alongside the Good Samaritan. Is that an accident? I don't think it is. I don't think it is. See, the Good Samaritan is a prick to godly action. The Good Samaritan story shouts, do good, even when it was racially scandalous to do so. Do good, even when everyone else has decided it's too problematic. Do good, even when it costs you a ton and is anything but convenient. Do good. Do, 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 do. And Luke 10 positions these two stories side by side. Be a Mary. Sit at the feet of Jesus. And be a good Samaritan. Serve your neighbour. See, this sitting with Jesus and this serving with Jesus actually belong together. They're friends. One serves the other. They're synonymous. So our walk of faith is not performance-based. Even John says this here in chapter 15 of John. It's positional-based. It's about me staying close to Jesus. I abide in the vine. That's my focus. But, 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 don't miss the spin-off. If I do, I'll always be producing. It's never ever a passive thing. We, we have sometimes sort of biting as an invitation to go and sleep on the couch. Ah, uh, ah. Uh. Abiding in John 15 has every bit of activity attached to it imaginable. It's a prolific life. It's an overflowing life in good fruit as designed by Christ. If I miss this, I'm a branch that's in, at risk 
of elimination. This is tough. This is what we hit in verse six. God's appetite for fruitfulness is unmistakable. It's fierce. The branches that are unproductive will not be tolerated. Not only will they be removed, they'll be gathered up and burnt. It's a detach and destroy mission. It's harsh. It really is. And it's people. Verse five makes it clear. Jesus says, I am the vine. You are the branch. It's people we're talking about here. It's people. It's potentially you and me. They'll be cut off. That idle branch, that idle person, cut off, gathered into a pile and set on fire. Wow. This is a big deal. What's this mean? Well, wherever we see fire in the scripture, it normally refers to God's judgment. So does this mean eternal damnation? Is that what John 15, 6 is all about? Well, whichever way I land here will land me in the fire. So I'm going to be careful in my response. There's various translations, interpretations of this scripture. Some will jump to the position and claim, this means we can lose our salvation. Someone else will point back a few chapters in the same gospel, John chapter 10, where it says nobody can snatch us out of the hand of the one who gives eternal life. So it mustn't mean that. So where do we land on a passage like this? To use country lingo, we could argue about this until the cows come home. And now that I live in the city, the cows ain't coming home. So let's fast forward to the bottom of the line and say, can we agree on this? Can we agree on this? John 15, 6 represents an awful place, an awful place. The, the state reflected here of an unfruitful branch is to be avoided at all costs. It's ghastly. It's ghastly. Whatever you think theologically on issues like this, John 15, 6 is absolutely a place to avoid at all costs, at all costs. If it's not about losing your salvation, if you're really flipping about this, then I would encourage you to seriously ponder on what does it mean? What does it mean? We need to rush, but I need to clip a vital point here before I move on. To those of you who, with an overactive conscience, see a scripture like this and go, oh, it must be talking about me. I've committed the unforgivable sin. I'm in danger of the next time God's in mind, got a bushfire in mind, I'll be in that fire. You're paralyzed by guilt, always feeling the worst, fearing the worst rather. And you come to a passage like this and you think, I'm next. God is wiping me of his family. Well, can I just say that in pastoral ministry, I've encountered these people many, many, many times who come to me in tears with a guilty conscience, feeling like they're too far gone. And can I also say, that 99.9% of the time, they're okay. Why? Because their tears tell a story. Their tears reflect a humble heart. Their tears reflect their hunger and thirst for righteousness. And actually, I don't fear for that person who comes in tears. I fear for the person who can commit the exact same thing and kind of Flick it off like it's a fly that they don't need to be concerned about. Yes, we do need to be concerned. Let's move towards wrapping things up. What have we learned? What have we learned? That we need to stay connected to Jesus to live fruitful lives, stay close to him because we'll be better off for us and better off for him. So we've covered off John 15, well, sort of. Sort of, there's a kicker. And here it is. Whilst being unfruitful, is deadly being fruitful is also difficult being fruitful is difficult now some of you at this point in time are going john i'm not following your logic i thought you said in jesus i'll find true life real life you know i'll get connected to the vine and then i'll discover the meaning and purpose and joy in life well yes you will but don't miss the honesty of john 15 it's there in your bibles fruit bearing will hurt the fruit bearing process is going to hurt. Let me spell it out clearly. The fruitful branch and the unfruitful branch are guaranteed the same thing. A knife 
a knife. They will undergo the process of being sliced. Apparently, John 15 is clear in the information. No branch, no branch, no branch. No matter how faithful and fruitful they are, are spared from the gardener's blade. 100% get the cut, no exceptions. It's just the purpose of the cutting. Being productive means you get to stay connected to the trunk. However, it doesn't make you immune from the gardener's cuts. He's still pruning. He's still trimming the most fruitful of branches. If you're living close to Jesus in a way that honours him, what comes next? A cut from the master gardener. The father never sits back and applauds the fruitful life and goes, oh, let them be, they're doing well. No, no, no. He cuts. Let's not get too poetic with this illustration here in John 15. Don't dismiss the interaction between chief gardener and branch. It hurts. They get cut. The gardener, God the Father, is never ever satisfied that a branch is fruitful. He's determined that that branch will bear even more fruit. Because you see, he's made himself vulnerable in this regard. A trunk can't bear fruit. God is relying on the branch. Aren't you amazed as you look back at your life and think about some of the things that God's taken away? You thought it was going to kill you at the time. But you look back and actually maybe there's times you've survived and even thrived. Some of you are saying, John, if you're trying to convince me to follow God and the logic you're using is you really should follow this God because he's going to chop you to pieces, but all will be well. Your life will be better off for it. Well, that doesn't sound like a very persuasive argument. No deal. While we go to this place of surrender with God, here's why. Whilst that pruning process in order to bear more fruit will hurt, it will never harm. It will never harm. And there's a clear distinction between the two. See, the master gardener doesn't cut to kill. He cuts to bring more life. Actually, will it hurt? Yes. Will it harm? Never. On the contrary, we were made for this. We were made for this. My testimony is every time I've tried to sustain a life, Apart from the true vine, I end up looking like that. And on the contrary, it's as I surrender to him that I find life actually takes on a new dimension and I grow and press in to that new season. Church, I love you enough to tell you that following Jesus hurts. It does. That is where real life is found. We were created for this. The Bible tells us so. We were created in Christ Jesus to do good works. And the fruit bearing process, yeah, it hurts, but it's where real life is found. In prayer, we say, Jesus, we commit ourselves to you to stay connected to the vine, even when it doesn't feel comfortable. Lord, be a helper. Give us grace to trust you to keep going because we know, Lord, when we trust you, we're safe. We don't need to understand. We can rest. Thank you, Lord.